Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about motion prediction for autonomous vehicles using the new Lyft dataset that came out a few months ago. I'm Dan Cher and the other presenters will be Kome Karia and Yahel Nacho. The agenda for today's meeting will start out with an introduction to autonomous cars then we'll dive in to understand the specific problem that we were tackling, going over the different methods that we used uh, talk about our ensembling methodology uh, to improve these these methods and finally finish with some conclusions and future work regarding this project. The study of autonomous cars really kick-started in 2004 with the DARPA challenge which was set by the Department of US Defense where a lot of the teams were tasked with creating driverless vehicles that could go through a 150 mile course. The winner at that time actually only went 7.32 miles. Uh, but since then, there's been a lot of research and we've come a long way. We still have a long way to go, but a lot of the front runner companies that are leading the charge in the autonomous vehicle space are Google and Waymo, among others, that have fleets of cars out there within the U.S. in different cities, Ann Arbor, Phoenix, gathering sensor data and operating already at lower levels of automation. Our problem specifically deals with level five uh, of automation, which is full automation um, and full autonomy, which in a broad sense would require the, the vehicle to accurately predict uh, all agents in its environment as well as follow traffic safety rules and do this across many different environments. The data set that we're using is the largest public collection of vehicle motion data to date. Published a few months ago, it's a few times larger than the next closest amount of information in a similar space. We have over a thousand hours of traffic agent movements just an enormous amount of data and this data is actually very rich. Um, if you look below on the left of the slide uh, we can see that the data had, has different scenes of time and for each scene there are many frames or you can think of them as snapshots of time. And so within a specific frame we have information about the agents and vehicles in the scene as well as traffic light information. This agent information uh, contains things such as the centroid of the agent at that particular point in time, velocity, the yaw, as well as the label, uh, if it's a, a vehicle, a bike, or a pedestrian. And in addition to this raw, rich information, we can also use a rasterizer and create an image using the information so that we could use the data in image form as well. To get a better idea of the information, we can take a look at it across time. So here on the left, we see the path of the ego car. Uh, ego meaning a car that has the many sensors attached and is collecting data on its surroundings, on its surrounding agents. Now on the right, you can see the actual information being collected. So across this time path that it travels from in the southeast direction, all of these little dots represent all of the different agents that it interacts with. So Dan's mentioned that we're solving a problem called motion prediction for autonomous vehicles, but what exactly does that mean? In order for a level 5 autonomous vehicle to drive safely in the roads, there's many steps that have to be taken. The first one of which is perception, which is taking the input from the sensors such as cameras and lidars and combining them in a way that allows you to detect objects around you instead of just pictures. So this step combines all the inputs from the raw sensors and returns the position and the object types of all of the surroundings of the ego vehicle. Interestingly, this step was actually done in a previous lift competition, but the next step, motion prediction, is the one we're doing. So motion prediction is predicting the future state of the surroundings. What that means more specifically is if you know that there's a car next to you, you need to know what that car will do in the next couple of seconds. 
Why this is important is because in the final step of trajectory planning, which is the process where the car decides what path it'll take in the future in order to get its passengers to their destination safely, you have to know where all of the surrounding vehicles will be in that future. For example, if you're about to turn left on an unprotected lane and you see a car coming from, uh, from the left, you have to know whether that car will stop for you or if it'll keep going. And you have to be able to predict that before it actually does that in order for you to make a safe decision of whether to make that turn or wait for the car to pass. More specifically, we're given the 10 pass frames, which is equivalent to about one second of real time. And we have to predict the state of all, all of our surrounding vehicles for the next 50 frames, which is the next five seconds. And by solving this problem, in reality, the car can have a constant five second view into the future of what it thinks will happen so that it can make the right driving decisions now in order to avoid an accident in the future and get its passengers to their destination safely. Since we're predicting the motion of vehicles in reality, which are bounded by the rules of physics, the initial model we came up with was a constant velocity model, which is a physics-based model. This assumes that given the velocity of the car at the current time step, that the velocity will stay constant through the next five seconds. So if a car is going straight on a highway, we assume that the car will maintain that speed and continue that path for the next five seconds. And especially in cases like that, this isn't a bad prediction. But more importantly, this CVM model does not require any training at all since the prediction step is simply plugging into a linear equation. However, as you can imagine, there's many downsides to this. The first one is the lack of awareness of its environment. So if you imagine a more urban situation, there's a lot more factors that go into whether a car will maintain its speed, slow down, or speed up, including traffic lights, uh, other vehicles around it, and obstacles like pedestrians or cyclists. And this model does not take any of that into account. Another issue with this type of model is that it has no awareness of its history. Even if the car was right in the middle of a curve, it has no awareness of the previous time steps. So it'll assume the car goes straight, even though if you simply look at the uh, 10 frames before it, you could clearly see that it was already in and will continue to make that turn. It's important to note that the CVM has a very high error score of about 27,000, which although it's much better than randomly predicting, is, is a pretty high error score. Ultimately, these two issues, the lack of spatial and temporal awareness really hinders the model. And the next few models that we developed really try to address these two issues. So now we'll go over a quick exploratory data analysis using a bird's eye view of the data. As you saw before, we can take our frame, which consists of a set of agents pass it through a rasterizer and produce a bird's eye view of that frame. This gives us important spatial information about this frame, such as cars around the target vehicle, the lane lines, and the current traffic light state. Here you can see the difference between two timestamps and that the traffic light turned from red to green. This information can help predict future motion, since when the light turns green, we can predict with a high confidence that the cars will start to cross the intersection. To process this information, we can use a convolutional neural network, which takes a picture and learns a set of features about it. In this picture, you can see that the image is convoluted at different steps, and as the resolution goes down, the number of features increases, which is denoted by the depth of each layer. This convolution tries to learn how adjacent pixels and features influence the final set of features we are trying to learn. The last layer on the right is a flat array of our predicted features. At subsequent stages of the CNN, it learns more and more complex abstractions. In this example, you can see that the earlier layers learn lines and contrasting areas. 
the middle layers learn partial facial features such as eyes, mouths, noses. Finally, the last layers in this example are able to classify faces, but in our case we will use it to predict motion. In our particular CNN, we will take 10 historical rasterized frames as input and pass it into the CNN. The CNN will then predict three future paths. Each path will have a confidence score and 50 future X and Y coordinates. This means the final output layer has 303 features. Giving the CNN multiple frames as input will give the model some temporal information about the scene so that it can tell which direction the cars are already moving in. For our particular CNN, we chose a ResNet 18 model, which is popular in image recognition tasks. The 18 refers to the 18 convolutional layers. The last two layers here are one by one, so they are not counted towards the convolution. This model got an NLL score of 13,945. The disadvantage of the CNN is that it does not formally know that the input data we are giving it has temporal information. It infers from the back propagation during training that those frames are linked in some way and help it predict the motion of the target vehicle. It would be better to use a model that understands how to use this temporal data in a more efficient way. A recurrent neural network is a model that can learn on temporal data very well. The unique part about an RNN is the hidden output layer which feeds the next timestamp layer. As the RNN is trained, it learns what data is important to keep by figuring out if it helps it to predict future data. The specific RNN we chose to use was a long short-term memory RNN. The internal structure of these are more complicated since it tries to remember historical data that is important in the short term while also keeping older historical data that is important for the long run. The final model that we built combines the spatial awareness of the CNN and the temporal awareness of the LSTM in order to more effectively train and predict the motion of other vehicles. This model is called the CNN LSTM encoder decoder and it incorporates the benefits of both of these base models. Just like the RNN or the LSTM, we take a series of rasterized images but instead of feeding them directly into a RNN, we first feed them into a CNN, which extracts the most important spatial features from each image, which is then fed into LSTMs. As you can see, we have 11 of these LSTMs stacked together, 10 historical frames and one current frame. And these are combined into one uh, information vector in the center by what's called an encoder decoder. An encoder decoder is effective at sequence to sequence translation. And in this case, we take a sequence of 11 inputs, which is decoded into 50 outputs, where 50 is the number of future frames we want to predict for. Then the decoder section of this model takes the information vector and decodes it into 50 different LSTM nodes, which all have an output of two by one, which represent the 50 future coordinates for the car we're predicting the motion for. Compared to both the CNN and the CVM, the encoder decoder does much better with an error of 7968, which is very low for the amount of data that we trained on. When building these base models, we were faced with an issue. Can we somehow use these deep learning architectures on this large amount of data while still being computationally efficient. Each of these models takes many hours to run on somewhat powerful machines and using it on the full data set would just take an intractable amount of time. So the solution that we came up with to face this problem was to use weaker learners and ensemble them to then create a large strong learner. And it's kind of borrowed from the idea from the random forest, where the random forest is built, as we learned from our paper, uh, on you know creating a lot of weak learners and through this ensemble creating a strong learner. So in a similar way, we set about taking our data set and sampling from it with the idea of creating specialized class classifiers. This way we're ensuring that we're still utilizing this large data set 
but we're doing so in creating models in a computationally efficient way. When we started testing our sampling and ensembling methodology, we saw that consistently across different types of deep learning architectures, many weak learners were outperforming one larger learner with an optimal number of around 10 parameters, as you can see in the bottom left graph. We started to dig in and try to understand why this was happening. And on the bottom right graph, you can see the validation loss over the number of frames over time. And we saw that there were these troughs followed by peaks, followed by troughs and peaks. And it was almost saying that there was different segments of novel information to one another in these different you know, portions of data. And so therefore, by breaking up this information and creating learners on each of this information, we would be utilizing this segmentation and capturing novel information from each grouping to ultimately create a stronger classifier. The takeaways from our presentation revolve around the overall process that we took for this modeling exercise as well as our results. Creating different algorithms gave us perspectives on the data. You know, how do we think about it from a spatial context? How do we incorporate temporal information? And through each disadvantage or thing lacking in a particular model, we were able to find the next step and systematically improve our base models. Overall methods takeaway is that the idea of ensembling weak learners is very powerful and goes across the decision tree family and works in deep learning. It worked well in our testing on deep learning architectures, and it provides a good alternative for making use of big data if you don't have enormous machines to work with. And finally, looking forward, next steps to you know, this project would be validating results with a larger data set, given that we only used a smaller subset for ensemble testing due to time constraints, and trying to incorporate selective sampling methods to create even more specialized and distinct learners to further improve our ensembling methodology. Thank you for listening, and are there any questions?